Welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today, we are going to discuss the important issues appearing in the New Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 25th August 2019. The news to be discussed has been presented on the screen and time stamping for the same has been provided in the description box below. So let's start our today's discussion. Now continuing our series of prelims 2019 question discussion, today we will be discussing this particular question on which of the following Mughal emperors shifted emphasis from illustrated manuscripts to album and individual portrait? To answer this question, let us go through a question asked in the test series by Rao's IA study circle, specifically in the full length test number 08. The question asked was, consider the following statements regarding Mughal era paintings. Options were, Jahangir encouraged artists to draw and sketch using pencil. Second, the unique feature of Akbar's era is the use of golden and silver colors in the paintings. Third, Shah Jahan firstly made use of three-dimensional figures. Which of the statements given above is our correct? Options were one only, two and three only, three only and none of the above. Now let's go through the explanation as provided for this particular question. Now the explanation says that the defining feature of paintings during Akbar's regime was use of three-dimensional figures. Further, the artist encouraged use of calligraphy in the paintings. Another distinguishing feature of paintings in this time is the transformation of popular art to court art. It further mentions that Jahangir emphasized on bringing naturalism to his portrait painting. Another prevalent unique feature of Jahangir's paintings is the use of highly decorated borders. Whereas Shah Jahan on the other hand liked to create artificial elements in painting. Paintings during his regime lost liveliness as they were inspired by European painters. Further, he eschewed the use of charcoal to draw and encouraged painters to draw using pencil. So it was Shah Jahan who encouraged painters to draw using pencil. He further promoted the use of gold and silver color and liked brighter color on the palettes. So in this, the correct answer was D. That is, none of the statements given in this backdrop was correct with respect to Mughal era painting. Now let's go through the question asked by UPSC. The question asked by UPSC was, who among the following Mughal emperors shifted emphasis from illustrated manuscripts to album and individual portraits? Now the options were Humayun, Akbar, Jahangir and Shah Jahan. Let's go through the explanation again with respect to Jahangir. It says that Jahangir emphasized on bringing naturalism to his portrait painting. So the explanation provided by FLT of Rao's IA study circle specifically mentioned that it was Jahangir who emphasized on bringing naturalism to his portrait painting. Hence in this the correct answer was C that is Jahangir. So if you had attempted the full length test series of Rao's IA study circle and if you had gone through the explanations specifically with respect to the question on Mughal era painting, then you could have easily solved this particular question asked by UPSC in the prelims of 2019. The first news for today's discussion appears on page number 10. It says, UAE honors Prime Minister Modi with its highest civilian award. Further, even Bahrain also honors Prime Minister Modi its highest award. The United Arab Emirates honored Prime Minister Modi with its highest civilian award, namely the Order of the Zayed. Whereas Bahrain honored Prime Minister Modi with the award of King Hamad Order of the Renaissa. The UAE has honored the Prime Minister with its highest civilian award, the Order of Zayed, in recognition of the Prime Minister's pivotal role in building bilateral ties between India and United Arab Emirates. The Order of the Zayed Award was conferred on Prime Minister Narendra Modi by Crown Prince Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan and was done in a ceremony held at the Presidential Palace in Abu Dhabi. This news highlights that Order of the Zayed Award has been bestowed upon several world leaders such as Russian President Vladimir Putin, Britain's Queen Elizabeth II as well as Chinese President Xi Jinping. Now this award has been named after Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan Al Nayyan, who was the founding father of United Arab Emirates. And awarding Prime Minister Narendra Modi the Order of Zayed Medal acquired special significance 
as it has been awarded to prime minister in the year of birth centenary of sheikh zayed now with respect to bahrain prime minister modi has also been honored with the king hamad order of renaissance by the bahrain king hamad bin isa al khalifa on bilateral and regional issues now both these awards becomes important from your prelims perspective now in the dns dated 19th august 2019 ankur sir had discussed not only about the order of zayed medal but also about various other medals and awards which has been honored to prime minister narendra modi where he mentioned about the grand collar award given by palestine for the prime minister narendra modi received the seoul peace prize by south korea and became the first indian to receive so zayed medal by uae further the prime minister was also honored with un championship of the earth award to initiate international solar alliance further the highest civilian award by afghanistan that is amir amanullah khan award and also by saudi arabia that is king abdul aziz sash has also been conferred on prime minister narendra modi in 2016 further the prime minister has also been awarded the highest civilian award of the russian federation that is order of saint andrews apostle so these are the different awards and medals awarded to prime minister modi and these different awards given to prime minister narendra modi can be asked in your prelims examination now in the backdrop of prime minister receiving order of zayed and king hamad order of renaissance both by uae and bahrain in this context you must know the location of both uae as well as bahrain as you can see this is bahrain and this is uae and both bahrain and uae lies adjacent to the persian gulf so this becomes an important aspect from your prelims examination also the fact that bahrain is a small island close to qatar as well as saudi arabia so again these are certain basic facts with respect to location of uae and bahrain so from your prelims perspective this topic becomes a part of current event of international importance as well as world geography now with respect to uae as well as bahrain you must also know that both are part of gulf cooperation council now this becomes important because a question on gulf cooperation council was asked in the prelims of 2016 the other members of gcc are saudi arabia oman qatar as well as kuwait the question asked was which of the following is not a member of gulf cooperation council options were iran saudi arabia oman and kuwait in this the correct answer was a that is iran now moving on to the second part of news between india and uae it says prime minister modi urges nris to invest in jammu and kashmir it says that we also see that investors get good returns on their investment further it mentions about prime minister as well as the crown prince discuss trade so both this news is in the context of trade and also to enhance or boost trade relations between india and uae and in this the prime minister has paid special emphasis on the two newly created union territory of jammu and kashmir as well as ladakh now from your prelims perspective this news becomes important aspect of current events of international importance Now Prime Minister Modi has urged the NRIs of UAE to invest in India and also paid a special emphasis to invest in the newly created union territories of Jammu and Kashmir as well as Ladakh. The Prime Minister has said that the political stability in India and also the predictable policy framework in India has made India an attractive investment destination. further to attract investments from uae the prime minister highlighted that policies in india are framed in order to promote growth to generate employment avenues as well as to boost make in india prospects and in this regard the prime minister also ensured that investors will get good returns on their investment in india now emphasizing on jammu and kashmir the prime minister highlighted that jammu and kashmir has been neglected for years and urged the nris to invest particularly in the two union territories as they have a huge scope for development further the prime minister gave special impetus on developmental initiatives taken in jammu and kashmir and ladakh and said that investment by the nri community will play a major role in the growth engine of india and also will help in creating job opportunities for the youth in the two union territories further the prime minister also highlighted the tourism potential of the region and asked the investors to invest even in tourism 
Further, the Prime Minister also urged the entrepreneurs to identify as well as market the herbal products which are scattered in Jammu and Kashmir as well as Ladakh and said that global marketing of such herbal products will also benefit the locals including farmers who will be motivated to grow such herbal plants. So these are the various aspects highlighted by the Prime Minister to urge NRIs to invest in India and also in Jammu and Kashmir as well as Ladakh. Now with respect to trade discussions between the Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Crown Prince of UAE, it says that both India and UAE are working closely to implement the commitment of $75 billion investment by UAE in India. Further, they are also trying to improve trade and cultural ties and also trade and people to people relationships between the two countries that is India and UAE. Now with respect to annual bilateral trade, it says that UAE is India's third largest trade partner as there is a bilateral trade of around $60 billion between UAE and India. Further, UAE is also the fourth largest exporter of crude oil to India. And UAE is also showing its interest to increase investment in various sectors in India such as renewable energy, food, ports, airports as well as defense manufacturing. And in this backdrop, even investments in infrastructure and housing are being enhanced by UAE in India. So it was on these aspects that Prime Minister Narendra Modi and the Crown Prince of UAE held trade discussions between the two countries. The next news appears on page number 15. It says, IIT Hyderabad develops waterproofing material using fly ash. Steric acid coated fly ash surface can be made to behave like rose petals or lotus leaves. Now scientists at IIT Hyderabad has converted the properties of fly ash from hydrophilic that is water loving to water repellent that is hydrophobic and this has been done by coating fly ash with stearic acid. So in this analysis let us learn certain basics about fly ash as well as stearic acid and also with respect to the coating of stearic acid on fly ash. Now a question on fly ash was also asked in prelims of 2015. Hence it becomes important to know about fly ash as well as its coating with stearic acid in order to make it a water repellent. Now this topic becomes a part of general science in your prelims examination. The question asked in 2015 was with reference to fly ash produced by power plants using coal as fuel, which of the following statements is are correct? Options were fly ash can be used in the production of bricks for building construction. Fly ash can be used as a replacement for some of the Portland cement contents of concrete. Third, fly ash is made up of silicon dioxide and calcium oxide only and does not contain any toxic elements. So in this question, various options were provided such as 1 and 2, 2 only, 1 and 3 and 3 only. So let us go through the properties of fly ash and then again we'll try to answer this particular question. Now it says that fly ash is a byproduct from burning pulverized coal that is dust coal in electric power generating plants. And during combustion, the mineral impurities in coal that is clay, feldspar, quartz and shale fuse in suspension and float out of the combustion chamber with the exhaust gases. So basically when pulverized coal is burnt in a power generating plants then these fly ash float out of the combustion chamber with the exhaust gases. Further as this fused material rises it cools and solidifies into a spherical glassy particles known as fly ash. Thus Fly ash is collected from the exhaust gases by electrostatic precipitators or bag filters. With respect to properties of fly ash, it says that fly ash chemically reacts with byproduct calcium hydroxide released by the chemical reaction between cement and water to form additional cement products which improve many desirable properties of concrete. Thus, fly ash are used to make different kinds of concrete. Now two types of fly ash are commonly used in concrete mainly class C and class F fly ash. 
Now with respect to class C fly ash, it says that class C fly ash have high calcium content and less carbon content that is less than 2% whereas in class F fly ash it has low calcium content and has carbon content ranging between 5% to 10%. So these are the two categories of fly ash. It further highlights that fly ash is most commonly used as pozzolan in Portland cement concrete applications where pozzolans are materials having silica or aluminium which in a finely divided form and in the presence of water react with calcium hydroxide at ordinary temperatures to produce cementitious compounds. Thus pozzolans in the presence of water react with calcium hydroxide at ordinary temperature in order to produce cementitious compounds. And it is here where fly ash is most commonly used as pozzolan in Portland cement concrete. Further it also highlights about the environmental benefits with respect to using fly ash as concrete material. It increases the life of concrete roads and structures by improving concrete durability. So basically use of fly ash improves concrete durability. It also results in net reduction in energy use and greenhouse gas and other adverse air emissions when fly ash is used to replace or displace manufactured cement. So replacing manufactured cement by fly ash has also certain benefits with respect to reduction in energy use as well as reduction in greenhouse gases. It also results in reduction in amount of coal combustion products which must be disposed in landfills. So these are some of the environmental benefits with respect to using fly ash. Now steric acid is a saturated long chain fatty acid with an 18 carbon backbone. The steric acid is found in various animal and plant fats and is a major component of cocoa butter and shea butter. Further steric acid that is octa decanoic acid is a C18 straight chain saturated fatty acid component of many animal and vegetable lipids as well as in the diet it is used in hardening soaps, softening plastics and in making cosmetics, candles and plastics. So these can be said to be some of the applications of steric acid. Now let us understand what happens when fly ash is coated with steric acid. Now the steric acid has two parts. One is the head which is water loving and one is the tail which is water repelling or hydrophobic whereas the head is hydrophilic. Now the head of steric acid which is hydrophilic binds to fly ash particles whereas the water repelling tail remains free. Now these numerous free hydrophobic tails of steric acid makes the fly ash surface water repellent and it is this property which the scientists have used to make fly ash water repellent by coating it with steric acid. Further, the steric acid coated fly ash surface can also be made to behave like one of the naturally occurring water repelling materials by varying the surface roughness of fly ash. So this is how fly ash becomes water repellent when steric acid is coated on it. So after understanding about both fly ash and steric acid, let us go through the question asked by UPSC in prelims of 2015. It says that with reference to fly ash produced by the power plants using coal as fuel, which of the following statements is are correct? Options are first, fly ash can be used in the production of bricks for building construction. Yes, this is correct. Second, fly ash can be used as a replacement for some of the Portland cement contents of concrete. Yes, this is also correct. As you can see here that fly ash is most commonly used as a pozzolan in Portland cement concrete applications. Third, fly ash is made up of silicon dioxide and calcium oxide only and does not contain any toxic elements. No, this statement is incorrect. So in this the correct answer was A that is 1 and 2. Now the next news also appears on page number 15. It says understanding clouded leopards and their habitats. Now in this news, a research paper published by over 20 researchers from across the world has helped to understand clouded leopards, habitat, migration corridors and also this has helped to lay out a 
conservation strategies for these clouded leopards. In India, Dampa Tiger Reserve in Mizoram was chosen as the study site for these clouded leopards. And according to the research, Dampa had one of the highest population densities of clouded leopards from various sites surveyed. Now the study also noted when the forest cover or the closed canopy forest cover declined by 35%, then the clouded leopard detection dropped by 25%. So this shows that clouded leopard presence was positively associated with forest cover as well as rain. And this suggests that deforestation and reduction in rainfall patterns as a result of climate change may negatively influence clouded leopard distributions. Now this topic on clouded leopard in your prelims examination becomes a part of general issues on environmental ecology as well as biodiversity and climate change. The scientific name for clouded leopard is Neophilus nebulosa and as for IUCN it is vulnerable. It has also been mentioned in appendix 1 of CITES that is Convention on International Trading Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. Further, it also finds a mention in Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. Now as you can see in this map, clouded leopard is found from Himalayan foothills in Nepal through mainland Southeast Asia into China. The species is most strongly associated with primary tropical forest which is rapidly disappearing across its range. Further, these medium sized cats are typical rainforest dwellers but can also be found in drier forest of Southeast Asia. Although clouded leopard is vulnerable as per IUCN Red List, still India in 2018 added clouded leopard as part of its recovery program for critically endangered species for research and strengthening conservation efforts for clouded leopard. Major threats to clouded leopard are hunting for illegal wildlife trade as large number of skins have been seen in market surveys of these clouded leopards. Now these clouded leopards are also hunted for their trade in bones for medicines, meat for exotic dishes and also live animals for pet trade. Thus major threats with respect to clouded leopards can be attributed primarily to direct exploitation, range fragmentation as well as reduction in habitat quality including deforestation as well as changing patterns in rainfall. Further, its hunting is banned in Bangladesh, Cambodia, China, India, Malaysia, Myanmar, Nepal, Thailand as well as Vietnam. Regarding recovery program for critically endangered species of India, the National Board for Wildlife in 2018 has added four species in this program, namely Northern River Terrapin, Clouded Leopard, Arabian Sea Humpback Whale as well as red panda. So these four species becomes important again from our prelims perspective. Now apart from these four, there are 17 other species which has been included in the recovery program for critically endangered species. They include snow leopard, bustard including floricans, dolphin, hangul, nilgiri tar, marine turtles, dugongs, edible nest swiftlet, Asian wild buffalo, Nicobar, Megapod, Manipur brow antelier deer, vultures, Malabar civet, Indian rhinoceros, Asiatic lion, swam deer and, and Jordan scouser. Now questions have been asked by UPSC in the past on these different species mentioned as part of recovery program for critically endangered species. Now talking about Dampa Tiger Reserve, it says it is a wildlife reserve set in Lushai Hill Ranges of Mizoram near the Bangladesh border. Further, the rainforest of Dampa harbors several species such as swamp deer, tiger, leopard, elephant and hulog gibbon. Various species of birds are also found in the reserve including three hornbill species namely the great hornbill, rethet hornbill and oriental pied hornbill. Further, the giant flying squirrel and the fella squirrel are highlights of the Dampa tiger reserve. Now the Dangpa Tiger Reserve consists of tropical evergreen, semi-evergreen, tropical moist deciduous and sub-montane type of vegetation. And the Tropic of Cancer passes through the center of Dampa Tiger Reserve. 
so these are some of the important aspects with respect to dampa tiger reserve now dampa tiger reserve is also a protected area in the state of mizoram other protected areas in the state of mizoram includes murlin national park fangpui national park nengpui wildlife sanctuary honglung wildlife sanctuary lengteng wildlife sanctuary tawi wildlife sanctuary thorang klang wildlife sanctuary pualreng wildlife sanctuary and tokalo wildlife sanctuary and the protected area comprises of 5.88% of the geographical areas of the state of mizoram now protected areas of india includes marine protected areas national parks wildlife sanctuaries conservation reserves as well as community reserves now the protected areas in india covers roughly 5.02% of the entire country of which the maximum is covered by wildlife sanctuary that is 3.64% followed by national park that is 1.23% further 0.13% is covered by conservation reserves and 0.02% is covered by community reserves thus all this information about clouded leopard dampa tiger reserve about protected areas becomes important from your prelims perspective the next news appears on page number 14 it says will india change its no first use policy what will happen if the country's nuclear posture is revised in the most dangerous place in the world what about the stand on deterrence now this news has appeared in the recent context with respect to a statement provided by defense minister rajnath singh the defense minister had said that india's no first use policy on nuclear weapons depended upon changed circumstances in the future and this statement by the defense minister had therefore raised apprehensions on the likely revision of india's nfu that is no first use policy and nuclear doctrine so because of this raised apprehension on likely revision of no first use policy as well as nuclear doctrine of india the government of india later clarified that this was a personal statement given by the defense minister and this was not the statement of government of india the nuclear doctrine becomes a part of gs paper 3 new mains examination specifically with respect to challenges to internal security and also with respect to developments in the field of science and technology now we have discussed about no first use policy on several occasions in previous dns videos therefore in today's section we will discuss the second main aspect of india's nuclear doctrine that is credible minimum deterrence as you can see india's nuclear doctrine with respect to no first use was discussed by mahak ma'am on 17th august 2019 so you can refer to the video of 17th august 2019 to understand in detail what was discussed with respect to india's nuclear doctrine specifically with respect to no first use policy so on this note let us understand the second main aspect of india's nuclear doctrine that is credible minimum deterrence now the main aspect of credible minimum deterrence is nuclear retaliation in case of any nuclear attack in india of any magnitude so on this note it mentions that the main purpose of credible minimum deterrence is to ensure a nuclear arsenal that can assure a second strike capability which means that in event of another nation carrying out first nuclear strike of any magnitude against india india's nuclear forces shall be ready to ensure survivability of the attack and the capability to carry out a massive nuclear retaliation aimed at the enemy country so this effectively mentions about two aspects first to survive the nuclear attack launched on india and second the capability to carry out instant nuclear retaliation on the enemy country so the whole aspect of credible minimum deterrence is the fact that india will launch a retaliation nuclear attack only when it is attacked by a nuclear weapon so this retaliatory aspects only after being attacked also showcases the need for defense and security so effectively it mentions that cmd intends to convey a non aggressive and defensive nuclear posture by projecting a nuclear arsenal which fulfills the bare needs of defense and security further it also mentions that the number of nuclear weapons india may possess over time or in future 
totally depend upon India's security situation. In this aspect, it highlights that CMD does not imply indefinite expansion of nuclear arsenal and also it is not an arbitrary control on number of nuclear weapons India may possess. So, the number of nuclear weapons India may possess over time totally depends upon India's security situation in the future. And in this backdrop, it mentions that India will not accept any restraints on building its nuclear research and development capability. So, while India is committed to maintain the deployment of a deterrent which is both minimum and credible, it will not however accept any restraints with respect to building its nuclear warheads capabilities. So, these are the important aspects of credible minimum deterrence. The next news appears on page number 30 in the business section. It says, surcharge may still apply to AIFs, that is alternative investment funds. Finance minister had earlier rolled back added tax liability on FPIs, but made no mention of AIFs. In this backdrop, let us learn about AIFs that is Alternative Investment Fund. Now in your prelims examination, this forms a part of Indian economy and in your means gets covered under GS Paper 3 with respect to Indian economy and issues relating to it. So what is an Alternative Investment Fund? It says that Alternative Investment Fund means any fund established or incorporated in India in the form of a trust or a company or a limited liability partnership or a body corporate. So we understand that an alternative investment fund can be established or incorporated in India in the form of a trust, a company, a limited liability partnership or a body corporate. And these trust or company or LLP or a body corporate which is a privately pooled investment vehicle which collects funds from investors whether Indian or foreign. So, they can either collect funds from Indian investors or foreign investors for investing in it in accordance with a defined investment policy for the benefits of its investors. And secondly, it says that such funds shall not be covered under Securities and Exchange Board of India, Mutual Funds Regulations 1996, as well as Security and Exchange Board of India, Collective Investment Schemes Regulation 99, or any other regulations of the SEBI to regulate fund management activities. So if there is any regulation of SEBI with respect to fund management activities, then such shall not cover AIF. It further says that most of the AIFs registered with SEBI are in the form of trust. Now secondly it says in what categories can an applicant seek registration as an AIF? Here it mentions that Applicants can seek registration as an AIF in one of the following categories, including the subcategories as may be applicable. These categories are Category 1 AIF, which includes venture capitals, including angel funds, second, SME funds or social venture funds, and infrastructure funds. Then it talks about Category 2 AIF as well as Category 3 AIF. Now with respect to category 1 AIF, it mentions that AIFs which invest in startups or early stage ventures or social ventures or SMEs or infrastructure or other sectors or areas where the government or regulators consider as socially or economically desirable and shall include venture capital funds, SME funds, social venture funds, infrastructure funds and such other alternative investment funds as may be specified. So these are the AIF category 1. Now let's see AIF category 2. It says that AIFs which do not fall in category 1 and 3 and which do not undertake leverage or borrowing other than to meet day-to-day -day operational requirement as permitted by SEBI alternative investment funds regulations. So basically category 2 AIFs generally take funds to meet their day-to-day -day operational requirements and do not fall either in category 1 or category 3 AIF. It says that various types of funds such as real estate funds, private equity funds, that is PE funds, funds for district assets, etc. are registered as category 2 AIFs. Now with respect to category 3 AIFs, it says AIFs which employ diverse or 
complex trading strategies and may employ leverage including through investment in listed or unlisted derivatives. Now various types of these category 3 AIF includes hedge funds, pipe funds etc and are registered as category 3 AIS. Now pipe stands for private investment in public equity. Now as per SEBI regulation it mentions that the following shall not be considered as alternative investment fund for the purpose of the regulation. So if a fund is registered under the following head then it will not be considered as an alternative investment fund as per SEBI regulation. These are family trust set up for the benefit of relatives as defined under Companies Act, ESOP trust set up under Securities and Exchange Board of India, share based employee benefits regulation 2014 or permitted under Companies Act 2013, employee welfare trust or gratuity trust set up for the benefit of employees, holding companies as defined under Companies Act 2013, other special purpose vehicles not established by fund managers including securitization trust regulated under specific regulatory framework. So any other special purpose vehicles not established by fund managers including securitization trust shall not be considered as AIF. Further it says funds managed by securitization company or reconstruction company which is registered with the RBI under section 3 of securitization and reconstruction of financial assets and enforcement of security interest act 2002 and any such pool of funds which is directly regulated by any other regulator in India. So all these shall not be considered as an alternative investment fund as per the SEBI regulations. Now after a discussion let's move on to these practice questions. So what you can do is to take a pause of 5 seconds. First question says which of the following countries can be said to be adjacent to Persian Gulf? Options are Qatar, Bahrain, Kuwait and Iran. Now in this all the four options are correct. D is the correct answer that is 1, 2, 3 and 4. As you can see in this map Qatar, Kuwait, Iran and even Bahrain are adjacent to Persian Gulf. Moving on to question number 2 it says consider the following statements about alternative investment funds. Options are there are three categories of AIF. Yes, the statement is correct as we have just seen. Second, family trust set up for the benefits of relatives are part of AIF. No, the statement is incorrect as they cannot be part of AIF as per SEBI regulation. So in this, the correct answer is A, that is one only. Question number three, it says, which of the following statements about fly ash is are correct? Options are, first, it is hydrophilic in nature. Yes, this is correct as it is water loving. Second, it is a byproduct of burning pulverized coal in electric power generating plants. Yes, this is also correct. Third, it has no environmental benefits at all. No, the statement is incorrect as we have seen certain environmental benefits on the use of fly ash as concretes. So in this, C becomes the correct answer that is one and two only. Question number four, it says, which of the following species has been added in recovery program for critically endangered species by India? Options are Northern River Terrapin, second Clouded Leopard, third Dugongs and fourth Malabar Civet. In this all the four options are correct. Hence D is the correct answer. With this we come to an end of discussion of today's newspaper. Let's move on to the question for the day.